happy weekend, everybody, and welcome to the second season of Zach's Had It Again. I'm your host, Zach Cooley, and I'm honored for the first episode of the season in this new weekend spot to have uh, a very dear friend of mine on the phone, uh, not to mention one of the greatest singers in the local music scene today, Mr. Ezra Ford. It is truly an honor to have you on the phone today, my friend. Happy New Year, my friend. You you flatter me with your kind words. Always a pleasure, sir. Well, let me let me just say this. When I heard Badunk Funk for the very first time, of course I grew up with uh your bandmate and our mutual friend Mr. Jeremy Hagee. Uh when I first heard you play with them for the first time at the Chautauqua Festival in 2012, that was the best cover band. You know, I've been doing uh, music reviews around the scene for almost 20 years now, so I've I've heard a lot of different local bands, a a lot of different music. That was the best local band I have ever heard, and in particular, your vocals, sir. I will put it to you this way: uh, when it comes to female voices, I'm I'm married to the greatest female voice I know. But when it comes to male voices, if I leave this world before you do, you would be the one I would like to do any kind of musical thing that's done at my funeral or wherever they choose to have for me when I pass on. So that is how I feel about your ability, sir. I'm humbled always, always so humbled by your praise. And my goodness, can you believe that that is the uh, first time you ever saw us at Chicago was all those years ago. It seems like it was just yesterday. Yes, and, yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. So, and I feel fortunate to have become good friends uh, with you over the last decade or so and absolutely you've seen me uh, you see me uh, play in several uh, venues and several incarnations at this point yes i truly believe you could sing the telephone directory if it was asked of you um, <laughs> so before we get in to the meat of what we're going to talk about um what are your music plans if you have any for yourself and the many incarnations well, that you're in well uh the, the primary uh the primary outfit uh is in going into 2023 is the breakfast club mm-hmm. uh, we like a good number of our uh, peers and our cohorts were a uh, little a uh, little delayed and a little slowed down in the uh, to the pandemic you know we tried mm-hmm. to do uh, live stream, but and that was a lot of fun. And Mr. Tom Snedeker from The Kind was uh, amazing to help us get that going because he always does such a great job in uh, broadcasting their sets. You know, it seems like you never miss a Kind show because he's always got such great coverage and knows exactly what he's doing technically, which I, you know, I very much do not know. So he was a great friend in helping us up out with that. But we just uh, returned to the stage uh, last September. We did, uh, we played Rumors out uh, at a little private event in Newport that was fantastic. And then we ended the year at Brick House Pizza with a little Christmas show, which I'm so glad that we did because it was such, it was such a blessing and it was so much fun to just be able to get together and just kind of, you know, celebrate the season and celebrate and learn and to play the sounds of the season. Obviously, some of those songs are time hard and we've been singing them since we were kids. But I, you know, I learned a new, uh, song called Christmas at the Airport by Nick Lowe. Uh, Nick Lowe put out a great Christmas record here in the past couple of years, and my bandmate Don Hildreth uh, hipped me to that, and I absolutely love his version of uh, Children Go Where I Send Thee, which is a song that I love, but I hadn't heard and honestly hadn't thought about in the last several years, and we kind of did a rockabilly slant on it, very similar to Nick Lowe's interpretation of it, so we found ourselves starting to ramp up a little bit at the end of the year. We'll be back at Brick House Pizza on February 25th, and one of the things we got asked a lot at that show was, hey, you're going to play some songs that aren't just Christmas songs, right? And we said, well, you know, it's Christmas time, and this is a Christmas show, but uh, towards the end, when uh, folks got a little loose and a little rowdier, we broke out a little tribute to Miss Christine McVie, who mm-hmm. we lost at the end of the year, bless her heart and soul. Mm-hmm. 
Uh, we did a couple of Mac songs at the end, and then folks kind of think it whetted everybody's appetite. Needless to say, they're absolute sweethearts and incredible hospitality at Brick House. So we look forward to getting back there and playing a, a proper set. And uh, I know uh, I know it would break your heart for me to tell you this, and uh, you know I hate to twist your arm, but we're uh, playing a bunch of Prince songs that night. So yeah, mm-hmm. I think you uh, I think you know we'll be fired up for that one. I have I have um, seen the your Prince tribute, the Purple Rain tribute that uh, Breakfast Club did uh, many years ago. It was unbelievable. And well, I was, that's what I was saying. Tw- twist, uh, you know, twist your arm to make you listen to some Prince songs, right? <laughs> sure, sure. <laughs> I I know you you uh, you and your missus are, are big Prince fans, and you know I will echo your sentiments that. Uh, that uh, wife of yours is quite the vocalist. She uh, well, uh, absolutely phenomenal. So you are not a. I, I'm sure you're her biggest fan, but she's uh, she's got a big fan of me. Yeah, but I also say that uh, you know I have been a critic longer than I've been married to her. So I will, <laughs> I will, I will, I will give her the straight of it. But it's it's uh, not very hard to be in praise, and I, and I and I and I have to tell you. Um, as far as the Prince thing, um, Emily's a much bigger Prince fan than I am. I, I when I went to, to see the show, I'm actually a much bigger Ezra fan than I am um, <laughs> Prince, honestly. But uh, it, it was a great show, and uh, Secondhand Jones in that incarnation, uh, you all did an incredible uh, Led Zeppelin uh, tribute show. And I'm still waiting for the for the Phil Collins Genesis uh, <laughs> incarnation. Oh man! But see, you hey, you know I'm jealous that you got to see him last year. Phil was so strong and so brave to be able to to play the way that he did on that tour. So, uh, you know that voice obviously, Father Tom is undefeated. So that voice is a, a little a little uh, a little more feeble than we recall in the '80s, but it's still absolutely fantastic to hear that man sing. Oh, I'm right. I'm telling you, I pl- I played. Uh, Bella, a clip of uh, Carpet Crawlers from 2007, you know, when maybe he had a little more, or supposedly he had a little more range than he did at that show that we saw in Charlotte in in November 20th, 2021, a red letter day in our lives. Um, but I played it for Bella and she said, I think you sounded better in Charlotte. And I said, I do too. So, <laughs> you know, uh, he, he doesn't have maybe the power that he had in the 80s, but he, he, his voice is still very, it's a, it's a nice, clear, clean sound. And, and, you know, and he's 70 years old. So how many 70 year olds will sing half that good? And he's sitting down too. It's different when you can stand up, but he's sitting down. So that you know, it, it was it was quite amazing. And well, I was I was jealous after you posted that. So I spent a lot of time flipping through YouTube, just looking up clips from the show that you went to, and just mm-hmm. from other shows on the tour. Mm-hmm. And uh, I always I loved. Uh, no, I mean I know it's probably one of the more popular hits, not necessarily as Deepika, but I love uh, No Son of Mine, yeah. and I thought. Uh, even if he didn't have the the punch that he used to have, just the the, the character and just the tone of the voice, and uh, just as as he's aged, how that's changed his voice, and it, it really does still absolutely suit those songs, and he still absolutely brings it. Yeah, and his son is a powerhouse on them drums. Let me tell you. <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah. That's that's got to be an amazing feeling to be tur- to turn around and see your kid there just to come to your daughter on a tour of that magnitude. Right, right. And, he, and I mean, everybody was incredible. So thank you for mentioning that. Now, you you and I are are simpatico because we have we have one child. We have, uh, and that one child is a girl who has us completely wrapped around her little finger. Uh, Be- life. Bella, sure. Bella in Bella in Bella in my case, who is eight, and Maggie in your case, who is how old now? 
13 years old. Oh, my goodness, you've hit the teenage years. My con- my condolences to you, sir. Oh, thank you, sir. I'll take I'll take all the I'll take all the love and prayers you can give me. <laughs> yeah, but uh you know, you you take her to all these awesome concerts. Uh, you took her to the Chili Peppers this year, which was one I was envious of. You know. Yeah. Oh yeah. I, I won those. I won those tickets and took her for her birthday. So oh, that was quite a night. That is cool. That is cool. I wanted to go, but I I had this friend that I used to to jam out with, and I said. Dude, I can't go to this show if you don't go with me. And he says, "Man, I I can't do those big crowds." And I, I you know, I I sympathize with that because uh, I took Bella to see Paul McCartney at uh, Truist Field in state at, at Truist Field football stadium, and the crowd and the people were insane. Over thirty thousand people in the rain, and I I get I get why people don't want to do those football stadium shows. Uh, it's a it's a chore, and I tell you, I don't remember the last time. I, I mean, I've been to plenty, but I couldn't tell you who I'd seen prior to that Chili Peppers because it was the Chili Peppers, the Strokes, and Thundercats. So, I mean, it was a phenomenal lineup. And right. The Strokes are still amazing. I saw the Strokes in Denver many, many, many moons ago. Wow. Uh, and to see them again all these years later in the middle of a football stadium with my daughter was pretty, uh, pretty cool and pretty surreal. Yeah. So, and it's uh, in that particular stadium many, many years prior, I had seen uh, the Rolling Stones. So Whoa. I can say, I can say I've seen an ACC championship game, uh, the Rolling Stones and now the Red Hot Chili Peppers. In that yep. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Yep. Can't beat that. And I have taken my daughter to see, Genesis, which is her favorite, and of course she has some some uh, you know, modern day singers that I'm not really too into, but I'll take her if they get around. Uh, but Genesis is our shared favorite, and uh, we we went to see Paul McCartney, and uh, we saw uh, Bonnie Raitt in June at a at a small venue, one of my very favorite venues, uh, Ovens Auditorium in Charlotte, seats about three thousand. Oh. It's it's incredible venue. So uh, yeah, we had we had a lot of fun with that. And the thing that you and I have done right is that we've raised our girls in rock and roll, real rock and roll. And uh, so tell me who Maggie's favorites are. Well, we've uh, we've been to see uh, we've been to see Weezer uh, with the Pixies. That was mm-hmm. a great show. That was the first like major because she'd seen uh, she saw Brian Wilson on the uh, Pet Town's 50th anniversary tour. Mm-hmm. And it rained on us there, but she had a great time. So mm-hmm. uh, we, we saw him. You and I, you were at the Ringo Starr show. Yes. Uh, and you know that she was there. She was so there. I was like, that was uh, that was the night before the beginning of school one night. So needless to say, yeah. that was pretty, uh, a pretty hectic day and a pretty long night. So, yeah. uh, you know, our girls can say they've uh, they've seen a Beatle right. you know, each. So I've I've seen uh, I saw McCartney a long long time ago. So to see Ringo too, and to see my daughter was great. I will tell you if this I, I swear, and I think she might back me up on this. I think her favorite show that we've been to is Weird Al Yankovic. Really, out of all those, absolutely, absolutely, wow. because Weird Al doesn't get the. I haven't seen the Weird Al movie yet either, which I absolutely have to see. Uh, he puts on such a show. The show that we went to, uh, we got incredibly good seats. And somehow late in the game, you know, we just decided maybe like the week before the show that we were going to go, and then we got there. I'm like, how do we get these seats? Because friends of ours that had gotten tickets earlier were just like, dude, you're in front of us. I said, yeah, mm-hmm. I don't know how we did it. But so the comedy, and he actually played with the Roanoke Symphony Orchestra that night. So they kind of backed his band up, and they, you know, played a suite of uh, – uh, classic movie themes like Star Wars and Indiana mm-hmm. Jones and Jaws and what have you. And that was a, a nice little warm up for Al because Al came out and of course, uh, you know, had all the crazy outfits and all the production and all the cool little videos and stuff. And we just uh, had an absolute hoot. And I think, you know, we still reference moments from all the shows that we went to, but I feel like we're still, mm-hmm. still talking about, you know, weird Al jumping out in the crowd or, you know, mm-hmm. we're in the, all the all the stormtroopers coming out because you know we're big Star Wars fans too. So mm-hmm. yeah, that's kind of I feel like that's probably her dark horse favorite was the Weird Al. Show. Wow. Well, um, and you said you saw McCartney years ago. I saw 
Paul McCartney years ago. Uh, it was July 28, 2010 in, in Charlotte. Would it have been that show by any chance? No, sir. I saw okay. him in D.C. in 2000. Holy cow, I guess it was 2002. <laughs> I, I think Emily was at that show. I think Emily and her sister Karen, whom you went to school with, had been on stage with, uh, I think they were at that show. I think I think you've told me that before. Mm. I think maybe one of them had told me that. Mm. That's amazing. In DC, but uh, when when we saw that when we saw him again in Charlotte in 2010, Emily and I had been married 18 days. So Ooh. so that was uh, that made for a very exciting, you know, newlywed. Pretty sweet little honeymoon trip. Yes. Of the honeymoon. Absolutely. Yes, Absolutely. yes, it certainly was. Because uh she she really um turned me on to the Beatles and I really uh shot up her appreciation for Phil Collins and Genesis. So uh we have we have seen some great stuff over the years as as have you, but really nothing has uh, you know, if you're beyond that, nothing is more exciting than a uh, Badunka Funk show. So the fact that <laughs> the fact that we've been able to 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 see you play in that group, and unfortunately, you know, we've lost what two members of that band uh, who were all were just irreplaceable, and you were mentioning. Um, the Breakfast Club, uh, our friend David David Badger, the wonderful, superbly talented drummer, has left us too, and we miss them all. Um, very much, very much so. Yes, sir. I can tell you that uh, getting getting these shows together, he still, uh, you know, this might sound a little strange, but it uh, you play music, and I feel like getting ready for some of the shows, and and the Breakfast Club getting ready to get back to it. Uh, we, you kind of feel them with us, you know, you kind of sense them. You know, you think about things that you would laugh about or a particular mm. part of a song or a particular moment at a gig. And, uh, you know, uh, John talks so much about how that Prince gig that you were at uh, talks about how special that gig was whenever we see footage of it now where, you know, my mom is sitting there and yeah. David is sitting there and I believe there's another friend of ours who was at that show and all, all those folks are no longer with us. So, I've yeah. been able to bring everybody together and, you know, you know, the story of how much Purple Rain meant to me, you know, and how much it meant to my mom. So to, I think that was probably the last time she got to see me play too. So I was just like, you know, I think if, if you'd ask her, uh, you know, the last time you're ever going to get to see him play, if he's playing, you know, the album that he sang to you when he was a little boy, now as a grown mm-hmm. man, he gets to do again. So looking back on that, just reiterates how much, you know, don't, I, I think we, before the pandemic, I think we it, we was all, we were all too quick to take for granted uh, the ability to get together and enjoy each other's company and and sing. And man, I you know if I was excited to do it uh, pre pandemic, I'm just losing my mind and chomping at the bit to get in front of people now because it's just like it's been so long. And let's I uh, you know I saw Clutch over the summer last year, and one right. of the things that Neil the Mighty Clutch, one of the I, I would say Clutch is probably the most underrated rock and roll band in the United States. But uh-huh. I can, that's a whole other that's a whole other podcast. Every right, time I've seen right. it, it's been phenomenal. And right. towards the end of that last clutch show that I went to, he made it a point. He was just like, you know, guys, let's never ever take this for granted again, because you right. do have those moments and you do have that spirit uh, when everybody comes together, just as as a communal body, just enjoying music and enjoying rock and roll. And you know, pre pandemic, you never would have imagined that there were going to be an extended period of time where you didn't get to go out and enjoy that. And it's so many people's livelihoods and it's so, you know, so powerful and it's so important just, you know, to see your friends and to enjoy those moments together. So it's, you know, like I said, let's never, never take it for granted again. So it's just awesome. And thinking back to moments like that and good Lord willing in the Creek Dog, I was making more moments like that moving forward. Absolutely. And coming back to your mother for just a minute, if I may, how, how responsible is she and her vast record collection for your singing talent and your your uh, foray into the music world, if you will? 
Well, now it's it's funny because, and I, I don't know, and Lord help me, I you know I readily admitted this in front of her. Mm. I didn't. I don't know if I was just embarrassed when my my mom would sing or what, but I just. I, I just didn't like my mother's voice mm. and it absolutely broke her heart too. Like, cause she would sing all the time. It didn't matter, but I was like, right. oh, mom, oh, you're embarrassing me. You know, yeah. so I, she, Bella said, so Bella she, says that to me all the time. So I know exactly <laughs> how you feel. Yeah. Oh yeah. No, it's, it's come back to me tenfold. I'm some, I'm sure that, you know, mom's somewhere giggling, but I'll get the exact same thing from my daughter. So, uh, but as far as the music that she played for me, uh, that just massive, just massive because mm-hmm. uh, I got picked on a lot in elementary school because I was digging through her record collection. And I will tell you this, I think that our girls generation, people are so much, they're so less judgmental of the music that people enjoy. Right. And the people, and I mean, cause you have kids today who absolutely love, the Beatles and the Stones and Nirvana and Soundgarden and Pearl Jam and, you know, like bands that I would have enjoyed in high school or bands that I, you know, I would have gotten picked on. I got picked on in like fourth grade for listening to Aerosmith and the Beatles and Led Zeppelin. And because it just wasn't what my peers were listening to. I mean, a couple of them might have been just because they were also rummaging through their parents' record collection or that's what was being played at, at home. But, you know, people would look at like that blue album, that greatest hits album by the Beatles that had all the latter era hits, quote unquote, the famous and classic red album and the blue album. So people, you know, I'd have like the blue album tape in my jacket and fall out or something. People were like, what is this? What, why are you listening to this old guy music? You know, so now well, I'm sure their kids are listening to that music too. <laughs> I, I, I think, I think I can speak to that because the music in our girls' generation is so. I mean, first of all, in my opinion, I could get really on a soapbox and say it's not music at all. It's machines, <laughs> in, including the voices. But we, back in our, in our generation, we had superstars that you had in our parents' generation. We had superstars. There was the megastar of the generation was the Beatles, and then... In our generation, it was Michael Jackson, and they and they weren't just there for two minutes; they were there for ten or fifteen years. Mm-hmm. And and you know the fact that um, my baby is into Genesis, people are still going to be talking about Genesis. And if Genesis were lucky enough to be alive when they were one hundred and ten and thirty years, they'd still be selling out stadiums if they wanted to if they wanted to come. You know, they no, no matter how old they get, if they want to say, I'm going to go on tour, they would still be selling out stadiums. And well, because it's, they, they came from a generation where you had a body of work. Mm-hmm. You know, you didn't, you didn't just have that one good record or you didn't just have that one single, right? You know, I don't right. want to call, you know, I think, I think the term one hit wonders can, can be kind of offensive to, you know, any number of folks, but I, you, you're right. I mean, I don't think that you see artists putting out like a body of work where they go on a run where they have two or three like classic records. Like when you think about what the Stones were doing at the end of the 60s, the beginning of the 70s, where they were just dropping like Let It Bleed and Exile on Main Street and, you know, Beggar's Banquet, Goat's Head Soup. I mean, those bands would get on a run, you know, the Beatles do it, Rubber yeah. Soul, Revolver and Sgt. Pepper. You know, there there aren't a lot of artists, I think, maybe you could even go back the last 10, 20 years, that are capable of putting out that kind of body of work. So I think that's why you don't see a lot of artists in, in the modern era uh, going on the kind of runs like those classic, classic artists were going on. Yeah, right. And even the, you know, like you said, I, I would go back even as much as 25 years because I was on that mainstream train until about the mid 90s when Whitney Houston lost her voice and then that's kind of about the time I lost interest in mainstream because that's when the legends started falling out of mainstream and well and I think the the sad thing is if the Beatles were a band today I mean they could be putting out 
you know, those, I mean, uh, you know, obviously I don't think they would have been the mop tops like, right. they, you know, like they were, but right. I think they would still be making records in the vein of the White Album and Abbey Road and stuff like that. And, yeah. and the Beatles, if they existed in the modern era, would probably be a little indie band, you know, right. just, pl- just kind of torn in like a, a van or at least like, you know, fairly, I don't want, necessarily want to say underground or independent, but I don't think they would be. They wouldn't be looked upon as like the generation defining talent that they were. I think it would just be a band that like people who know, know, you know, and maybe they'd have an album that would cross, you know, that would get huge at some point, but I don't, and and that doesn't mean that Lennon and McCartney would be writing songs that are any less great. I just think that it's a different world and I think it's a different medium. I, I agree with you. And I think that, um, you know, Paul and Ringo are putting out uh, new music. They've been putting out new music the last 20, 30 years. And mm-hmm. and so the new stuff that I heard from McCartney at the new show sounded great. But it but people want to hear that that timeless stuff that just hit in the 60s and was just, you know, wide open. And Elvis was was wide open i mean he he was too much he was his star was way bigger than he was 